Hello, hello. All right. Okay, hi everyone. Hello, hello. This is a waiting area. I'm Diana. And let me get the Q&A ready. Hello, hello, hello. I'm gonna put this here, lower that. Dismiss. All right, everyone, I'm going to st stop the video and start the PowerPoint. So there is a chat I'm going to look at. Welcome. All right, put that there. And Okay, everyone, I'm gonna start the slideshow. Let me know if you can see everything. All right, okay, so let me know if you can see it. I am not on the screen, but welcome. This is the first generation and law school presentation. This webinar is about being first gen and navigating the law school application process. I'm Diana, I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at the University of Idaho College of Law. Um, we have two locations at our law school. I'm located in Boise, Idaho, and the, the Moscow campus is about five hours north. So I serve as the Associate Director, I do outreach, and I'm also a graduate of University of Maine School of Law. I graduated in 2013. And I also earned a master's in public administration. And I navigated those both processes as a first gen. My parents did go to college later in life, but the traditional out of high school, straight to college experience, I'm the first one in my family to have that. So I have learned through experience about being first gen, and I'm looking forward to sharing this information with you. Well, what exactly is first generation? And it all depends on who you ask, um, but the main de definition is first, defini first generation are individuals whose parents or legal guardians have not completed the bachelor's degree. So that's the traditional definition. There's some that are first gen law students where they don't have any access to anybody who has gone to law school. Um, but the traditional definition is someone who has, is the first in their family to complete college. So what is there to know when you are applying to law school as first gen? There are some important questions to ask when you are meeting with a law school representative, if you're going to law fairs, you want to, or these are questions to ask yourself. So before you even go down that rabbit hole, uh, looking at law schools, determining who you wanna to apply to, let's think of the initial application process. The first question is, you wanna ask the law school if they have a rolling admissions or a hard deadline. Those are two different scenarios. A rolling admissions is when they start admitting individuals throughout the process. They might have a priority deadline, but they still admit applicants and review applicants after the priority deadline. University of Idaho has that system. There's other institutions that have a hard deadline. So what that means is you need to be mindful of when to take the LSAT. 
you should be mindful when to the LSAT for both type of pro, uh, application processes, but particularly when there's a hard deadline, there's some top schools that have a deadline of February 1st, which means they will not review applications after that date. And it is strongly suggested you apply the moment the applications go live. So there are different nuances with applying for a, a rolling admissions and then a hard fast deadline. So you want to ask that institution or look on their website, what is their role in the application process look like? You want to be comfortable with asking for fee waivers. This is an opportunity to save in the application process. The average, well, the range of application fees can be from $50 to, to $100, depending on the school. So be comfortable. Um, for us, we are very, very used to granting uh, application fee waivers to those who ask or those who meet with us one-on-one, -on -one, the, the admission representatives. But be comfortable asking and nothing's wrong with, with that. It's actually part of the process um, for law school admissions. You wanna ask the institution if they have any first-generation resources. There is a growing, Growing demand for such resources, for example, there are some institutions that have first generation organizations, they have first generation scholarships, they have first generation um, pamphlets. So do they have academic support? So you want to be keeping an eye on if that's a vital aspect for you in terms of your success, if an institution has first gen resources, you want to make sure that you ask the, that question too. And you want to ask if the institution offers scholarships for first gen or um, if within first gen you also are part of a minority or marginalized community. Be, be comfortable researching if they have specific scholarships for that. And I will speak to scholarship websites and resources for you later in the presentation, but this is just a good starting point of what questions to ask when you are meeting with representative for a law school or you're conducting your own research. So once you're admitted, which is one, congratulations, you've been admitted, it's a joy, it's amazing, you feel fantastic, you feel so accomplished. Now, what do you ask at this point? When you are admitted, it is quite all right to be your own advocate. You want to be proactive with doing your research. So when you're admitted, if you are local or you're a drive away, you want to meet with the law school representative, whether it's the director of admissions, the associate director of admissions, you have that right to request a meeting. It should not be burdensome to request a meeting whether you're an applicant or you've been admitted, it is our job to be here for you and present to answer your questions. So be comfortable with being your own advocate. It, is, it should be the comfort you have throughout your law school process. So once you're admitted, how would you describe your law school culture? You want the representative to describe that. For us at University of Idaho, we're a relatively small um, institution. We have two locations. We have a majority of residents. So I'm able to share that quote unquote elevator speech about our institution and describe the culture. And we also have student ambassadors that can provide more of a window. So if the admissions representative has one answer, it's quite all right to seek the students to provide you with their perspective, which is a great segue into asking if the law school has first generation law students that they can speak to. For University of Idaho, we have a fair amount of first gens that are in our program. So I do have access to students that applicants can speak to or admitted students can speak to for further, in, further insight into the process. Okay, so this part, any questions so far? I do have a chat or Q&A part of it. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and do that. And I will entertain those toward the end or throughout. So just feel comfortable to enter the information in the chat, okay? So now, how do you incorporate 
your first gen status in your application. If you're not doing that through your personal statement, I strongly recommend exploring the use of your diversity statement. Okay, this is essential. While it is optional for most, if not all, law schools to submit, this is the space I'm going to explore and highlight of identifying and sharing your first generation status. Okay. What is the diversity statement? Well, it isn't specifically to underrepresented minorities or a racial or ethnic um, characteristic at first. What it is, it relates to gender, it relates to class, it relates to socioeconomic background, your abilities, and circumstances that set you apart. So personal statement for every law school, every law school is different, but generally speaking, a personal statement is your persuasive writing sample of why law school, why are you making this transition in your life? Whether it's a story, whether it's a moment of your life, whether it's your educational pursuit, whether it's exposure to the law at a certain age, whatever the case is, your personal statement highlights that. Diversity statement is an addition to your personal statement. And this is where you can definitely share your first generation experiences, any hardships you've been through. That being said, how do you draft a diversity statement? One, you want to take the time to reflect and make it personal to you, okay? There's plenty of examples of diversity statements online and you can probably see them and get a sense of what, how they're written, which they're, they're, those are decent templates. But again, it comes off genuine when it's written through your prism, through your eyes, and make it personal. Bring the reader to where you are. You want to demonstrate how being first gen has shaped you. And me particularly, I can share personally that I went to a state school. I had to dig through my institution to find resources for myself. I had to make appointments. I had to be extremely proactive and learn to ask questions. I've also made mistakes uh, as first gen where I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know what the strategy was to apply to college or law school or grad school. I wasn't proactive in understanding the value of studying for the LSAT or saving money to take a prep course. How first gen has shaped me is to be an oral advocate, is to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, it also has taught me to have grit, where you keep going despite obstacles. So that's how it shaped me. You want to reflect on how being first gen shaped you. Are you from a small town and you went to a large city? How did that growth shape you? Law schools look for maturity, they look for growth. They even if you had some hardships, they want to see accountability. How did it shape you? Is there maturity? Is there a space where when they have hardships in law school, those same qualities will allow them to persevere and grow and succeed. That's the most important is succeeding in this environment. So you want to fill in those gaps when they're reviewing your file by describing how first gen has shaped you. You want to keep it short and sweet and certainly concise. This is a good precursor into law school, the experience. Writing is essential, is fundamental to your success in law school. So what's your personal statement, your diversity statement? You want it to keep it diverse, uh, excuse me, short and concise. For most law schools, a personal statement is about two to three pages. You want your diversity statement to be about half of that. So you want to aim for one pager, one page and a half, double space. Okay. That will keep 
the audience engaged and it won't have them drift when you're writing a very verbose diversity statement. You can get straight to the point and showcase how it's how you are shaped by being first gen in a very concise way. You want to keep your you want to maybe talk about uh, an event, uh, an anecdote, a story that shaped you. Keep it short. Keep your tone positive and your mission very clear. You do not want to list all your hardships. That's not what a diversity statement is. And you wouldn't know that, right? You will probably say, okay, I've been through this. I have all these hardships. For law school purposes, the application process, you want it to be something that you haven't shared in your personal statement. This is not for you to rehash what you share in your personal statement. This is for you to identify and highlight an area that you have not shared. And if anything, it complements your application. So if you have to repeat something, don't write a diversity statement. You don't want to submit a weak one. I'd rather you not submit one at all. I'd rather you submit one that is strong, that shares your first gen experience, how it shaped you. If you already spoke to this in your divert in your personal statement, do not rehash it in a diversity statement. Okay. Any questions? Okay. What about when you're applying to law school? What to do? Here are some best practices I'm going to share with you. The first one is understand the importance of the LSAT. And I say this because I meet applicants who have little to no resources when applying to law school. And there is this fear of the LSAT. And that fear of the LSAT curbs their drive to see it as a means to an end. If anything, they avoid it. They avoid studying for it. They have more of a laissez-faire attitude with the LSAT. They feel that they can overcompensate their score through the extracurricular activities, through their personal statement. And yes, all of those soft factors matter, but I want you to understand the impact of the LSAT. I don't want you to see it as this fear and this huge test that's going to define your future. What you wanna see it as a means to an end that is your gateway to opportunity. Opportunity for scholarship, opportunity for a school that will provide you with the tools you need to succeed as a lawyer, as an advocate, you want to be able to have this comfort of applying to law school, being admitted, rightfully admitted, and being successful the first year. The LSAT measures is an indicator, it's not, it's not correlation, but an indicator of your success your first year. It doesn't showcase your success your entire three years if you're gonna take the bar and pass it. It's more about speaking to your first year success. You deserve to do well. You deserve to do the practice test. You deserve to earn the highest scholarship you can. Because as first gen, many do not have the resources like family to help pay or access to an alum or access to things that others might have. You deserve to get the best score, which leads to scholarship, which leads to other opportunities when it comes to the admission process. So understand the importance, understand what it's testing you on. Once you understand what it's testing you on, you can attack it with strategy. You want to utilize free resources like the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy partnered with the Law School Admissions Council it's the same nonprofit that administers the LSAT and is a clearinghouse for application. They offer a free LSAT. That is heavy on drills. It's about 4,000 practice problems. It is a good starting point. You want to take a diagnostic. You need to know where you're starting. You might be impressed. You might be, don't pre-study to take the practice exam. Take it. Just ripped off the Band-Aid and take it. Once you take it, you're gonna have a strategy and that is where you wanna do it. You wanna also take the LSAT early in the cycle. The cycles for application begin October through the summer. 
But again, back to what I talked about with rolling emissions and a hard, fast deadline, advantageous LSAT test taking times is in the fall. That way, should you need to take the LSAT again for scholarship renegotiations, you have the spring to do that. You wanna take it in the summer or fall to give you that time to study, to prep, and to be prepared, okay? You wanna dedicate time to drafting your personal statement or any of your writing samples, You aside from, so basically your diversity statement, your addendum, your personal statement, those are writing samples to the admissions committee. I can't speak for all law schools. For our law school, our admissions committee is comprised of all individuals all have JDs. We have faculty, we have tenure faculty, we have first year faculty, we have associate dean, we have a director of admissions, associate director of admissions. All of us look at your personal statement. You wanna take time to edit, to draft, to have multiple set of eyes on it to ensure that it is high caliber. This is a professional school, okay? We do expect that type of writing to be polished. So don't do one draft and submit. Take the time to write personal statement. And you wanna check to make sure each school, you might have a general template, but sometimes schools have different prompts where you want to answer their prompts in their personal statement. You wanna highlight extracurricular activities, you wanna demonstrate leadership, especially if you have law related, you don't have to, but if you do, your extracurricular activities can showcase to the committee, oh, you are interested in criminal law, great, you have this, ex this internship you've done, or you part of the criminal justice society, and you brought in guest speakers, like that is an additional bonus um, and quality and richness to your application. So don't hesitate um, highlighting those. Work experience, they don't have to be paid. If you, again, if you have an internship that you earned, if you had um, a nonprofit position that might have been unpaid, but it still was work experience, you can highlight that too in your resume. You wanna explain hardships. Now, what this means is all law schools have character and fitness questions. And part of that will be if you had any academic trouble, if you had any debt, if you had hardships that impacted your success in undergrad, your GPA, you want to share that through an addendum, okay? Hardships can include medical, they can include taking care of a family member, they can include working multiple jobs of get by, you leave of absence, don't let the committee assume you have bad grades in a semester. You want to explain. Remember, explaining hardships is not an excuse. Explaining hardships, hardships is exactly that. They're explanations, they're factual. That way the committee can say, okay, her spring semester of her second year in college was profoundly impacted by working three jobs or, um, having medical issues or having an undiagnosed learning disability. If you have that, again, don't shy away from that because, oh, I don't want them to feel bad for me. No, it's sharing hardships to provide explanation. That's what those are for, okay? You wanna be realistic when drafting your, when crafting your law school list. What does that mean? Well, it means that you want to have a good blend of, of schools, three categories. You want a dream school, so those that are beyond, if you were to go to LSAC's website, you could put in your LSAT and your GPA, and it will give you a range of schools that are within, that are the likelihood of being accepted, assuming, you know, personal statement, assuming all factors are equal. If you were to go solely based on hard factors, you can see what schools would most likely um, admit you based on that, okay? So you wanna have the dream school. So dream schools are, you know, for many, it's the Ivy Leagues, the top 10 schools um, that have, you know, LSAT medians of 169, 170. So those are more dream schools. Reach schools are a little bit above what your, what your factors are. If you have a, let's say a 150 LSAT and a 3.5 GPA, and you're looking at a school that might have a median of 156, 154. Okay, 
that's a, that's reaching a little bit. And then you want to have a category of safety schools. You know, safety schools are those that, based off your numbers, you have a strong probability of being admitted, right? Or you are uh, above their median, okay? Law school medians, so this is something that you may not necessarily know. Law school medians, it is part of the process. Law schools are striving to create a class that's diverse, that is full of quality and richness. It, they're also trying to create a, a class with numbers that keep their median or increase it. So in a class of you know 100, we have about 450 applications and then 200 are admitted and then we ultimately get 100 who decide to go to law school. That 100 is what comprises our numbers for the incoming class. So when I say safety, you want to be, those are schools where you are ahead of their median. Reach is you're a little bit, be, you're a little less than their median, but not too far from the dream school, which is, again, Ivy League. Um, even if you have high LSAT, sometimes the Ivy Leagues are way dream schools because of the competitiveness. So you want to think of that too. So when you create your list, be realistic. In addition to that, you want to make sure you go through what you like as a prospective law student. Look at what you enjoy beyond the, you know, the numbers and the rankings. The rankings of law school are very attractive. I understand that. Oh, I went to a top 10 law school. I went to a top 50 law school. Yes, I understand that. Aside from that, you want to know that this is three years of investment of your life in this program. Know what you like. Do you want a small law school? Do you want a, more, a law school located in DC? Do you want it to be strictly regional? Do you want to live in a new city? Do you want to stay local? Um, do you have family support? Do you not worry about family support and you just, hey, I want to start a new life? Do they have resources? What's their student life like? You want to create characteristics for yourself that will shape the law school that's for you. Let's talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. This is what impacts particularly first generation students. I've seen this firsthand. I've experienced this firsthand. It is very strong and I'm going to speak to it as well as provide insight into how to overcome it. So what is imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome is the state of being afraid that you will be exposed in a way, that you are a fraud or an imposter. And how does this apply to law school? It's when you get admitted, you're excited, you're thrilled. When you are at orientation, you start hearing your classmates talk, you start experiencing this, and I'll talk about symptoms, you feel like a fraud. You feel like you do not belong. Despite your accolades, despite the fact that you earned your right to be there, there's this mindset that seeps in to tell you otherwise. And that's why it's showcased more in first gen because of the lack of security and the grit you had to do, you had to showcase when navigating the college experience. So law school is unknown for many, many people, even if they have family that went to law school. But when you are first gen, it is a very unknown environment. And because of that, there's some common symptoms. You have a fear. There's a fear of, I don't belong. And through that fear comes anxiety. That anxiety impacts student one else because they're hesitant to ask for questions, they're asked for help, they're hesitant to reach out. That mindset blocks them from being able to thrive in the law school environment, which is speaking to professors, speaking to staff members, being comfortable with saying, hey, this is hard. I need more clarity. And that's why professors are there. But when you have fear, you have anxiety, that comes insecurity. That insecurity, all of this compounded impacts you with imposter syndrome. Will I say you won't experience it in law school? Most likely you will. You probably already experienced it <laughs> in undergrad, right? Depending on where you went to school. So if you have experienced imposter syndrome, please let me know in the comments. I would love to 
to see who has. I'm putting it in the comments there. All right. Okay. So what are some common questions? Now, how do you know you're experiencing imposter syndrome? These are some key questions that even despite all your accomplishments, do you feel like they were due to luck or chance or appearance and not anything of your own, like smart drive and talent? That can be, hmm, am I feeling imposter syndrome? Do you ever worry you're gonna be exposed? Um, do you feel like you're a fraud? Again, despite all of that, you might not feel it now. You may have felt it in college. I felt it in college when I went to a, a private school my first year. Um, it was overwhelming uh, that I thought I was a fraud despite my SAT score and my application and getting in. I still felt out of place and that carried on in law school. So these questions, I, when I was creating this presentation, I also experienced these. So these are great triggers to know, hmm, I am experiencing imposter syndrome. This happens too in law school is, do you feel like everyone around you is working harder, is smarter, and doing a better job than you? Because what's gonna happen in your first semester, particularly, is you're gonna have a lot of those, a lot of those students who are like, oh, my parents went to law school, they're alum, and I interned for a lawyer, and you know, I'm gonna be on law review, where they drop certain terms where you're like, what? Wait a minute, why are they talking like that? If they're talking like that, do I not have that chance? And you're gonna definitely feel this your first semester. And knowing this in advance, knowing this in, uh, ahead of time will allow you to navigate it. Like, okay, let me, let me relax a little bit because I'm experiencing a little bit of imposter syndrome. So you find yourself terrified of making mistakes and constantly believing you're likely to make one no matter what you experience, what you're expert, how expert you are. So again, all of these can be questions to lead to, hmm, I am experiencing imposter syndrome. Here is five ways to combat imposter syndrome. This is how you're gonna conquer it. You're gonna combat it. This is how it is. First way is let's practice positive thinking. And that might sound obvious, but when you are in the thick of law school and you're tired and you're mentally tired and you're drained, you wanna tell yourself you deserve to be there. You want to go back to why you applied to law school and reread your personal statement. Positive thinking, you are amazing, you are fantastic, you are smart, you deserve to be here. You write, you say those things to yourself, positive thinking is going to help you impact that uh, to conquer imposter syndrome. Use logic. So <laughs> although you are in law school and logic is all around you, sometimes logic goes out the window and emotion seeps in. So when you are in class or you're applying to law school and you have people who are like, oh yeah, I want to get to all these schools, like my LSAT's 150, blah, 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 whatever they throw in your face. Use, use logic, like, okay, well, this person is quite talkative and I don't need to be around this energy, so I'm going to ruin myself. Or use logic, like all of us were selected to be in law school. We were admitted for a reason. I was part of that too. So if I wasn't supposed to be here, I wouldn't be here. Use logic, you know, know that you deserve to be in law school. If once you're admitted, you deserve to be there. And don't question why the admissions committee did that. They, that is logic, it's, that's the facts. You wanna build a strong support system. So that is why part of your decision-making process for a law school is be realistic, okay? If you're going to an environment that has zero support or limited support or an, a, a culture that you feel will not support you because of the location or maybe it's not culturally diverse. Those factors that are important to you need to carry those over to the law school experience. So do you have family at the, at, 
where you live when it comes to law school? Do you have a partner? Do you have friendships? Do you have a community outside of school, like your church, your stu- um, your, you know, and your organ your organizations, uh, your nonprofit organizations that you're part of? A strong support system is that space you can go into when you feel like the imposter syndrome is seeping in. You can go in that space and feel empowered, feel connected, feel engaged. That is why a support system is huge. Even in law school, you have classmates who are like you, either first gen or you gravitate to or you can learn from. That support system is essential because you gain that confidence through that system. Seek a mentor. That could be someone within your community, someone in your law school. Professors love to be your mentors. <laughs> they want you to succeed. Your staff at the law school wants you to succeed. Here at the law school, University of Idaho, I, like, I do not mind being a mentor for students because I know how it is to navigate these, these waters. Seek that mentor. It could be a professional mentor, a personal mentor. It is okay to have one even in law school. And reward yourself with achievements. You get your brief back from your professor and legal writing, and you have these amazing comments, or you didn't get like a C minus, or you got a B, B plus in law school, that is excellent. Reward yourself. Treat yourself to a movie. Every achievement that you get, you get an answer right in class. Do a little silent victory, right? Those achievements matter. They matter in law school. They matter throughout your academic career, but particularly law school where the imposter syndrome is a little more heavy your first semester, reward yourself. You study hard and you get these lists or you get all Bs in law school. All Bs, let me tell you that. (laughs) Those are strong grades. You get those grades, you ace a quiz, Reward yourself with achievements, okay? That's going to help you. All five of these will help you. Here are some strategies. Let's go more toward positive. So we got imposter syndrome out the way. Let's chat about strategies for you to be successful. Let's talk about it. One, embrace the challenge. Law school is is intellectually challenging. It is an intellectual pursuit. It is a mental push, but embrace it. The skill sets you gain from law school will never, ever leave you. I am in admissions. I'm in higher education. And let me share, the skills I gained in law school are huge for not only personally, professionally, civically. That challenge in law school prepares you for critical thinking. It introduces you to concepts and a way of writing you never would have imagined. So when you embrace it, when you know you worked hard to get into law school, embrace the challenge. Understand that you're going to work hard. When I say work hard, it's a different type of working hard. It is about understanding how to study, how to prepare for class, understanding that you are competing with yourself, have balance. You work hard because you're reading 100 plus pages a week. That's high density and it's very engaged and you have to be prepared for class understand you're going to be working hard seek additional scholarship and support programs so depending on the school there might be additional scholarships available for first generation after you get admitted and you want to make sure you join the supported programs that are there for you if your school has an academic success program where They have an optional class for you to introduce you to case briefs and take the class. You want to be around as much information that you can to best prepare for the law school experience, right? If it's offered, take it. If there's a study session offered by your teaching assistant, do it. If there's a first gen uh, group, join. You know, anything that can help you succeed academically or personally, so take those out. Prior to law school, first gen, especially, you want to understand student loans. You want to know how much you realistically owe. Um, that's through studentaid.gov. 
You want to understand the different tiers of financial aid. You want to understand if you qualify for financial aid. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a dependent or independent. Professional school is more of um, federal unsubsidized loans, and then you have direct plus loans, which is about credit check. So if you don't have any credit to co-sign on your loans, you need to be realistic about that too. So do your research. LSAC.org is where you go for financing. You want to be proactive and seek that knowledge. Do not avoid this topic because you don't want to be in a position where you're in law school, you see the law school loans you're signing for, and when you graduate, you see how much you owe. It's an investment, absolutely. I'm not going to shy away from that. But once you understand how loans operate and how much you currently owe, you can see, okay, that can impact what school you choose because if they're giving you a lot of money for law school, that will lessen your debt burden. So what you understand about loans, that can impact where you go for law school, which is a very cost benefit analysis, which is very fair to do when you're thinking of law school. And remain focused. Be that first gen grit that you have is powerful. Not everybody has that, okay? When you are accustomed to seeking out knowledge, asking questions, going to free workshops like you are right now, that's grit. That is the desire to succeed. That is helpful and powerful with law school. I'm telling you, not every classmate of yours is going to have that. They're going to have the, oh, well, you know, I'm so used to things coming to me or not really being proactive and I expect things or being entitled. No, when you have first gen grit, it helps you remain focused. And it gives you that bandwidth to push yourself even more, okay? So it is a blessing that you have first gen because it gives you that different perspective. Here are some resources for you that I found. Um, the first one is firstgenjd.com. That, that is a organization and an online tool created by first gen law school graduates. Um, it has great blogs, it has great information, um, and I think that the founders are accessible via email too. So firstgenjd.com, a starting point for every pre-law student, law school applicant is lsac.org. That's an incredible resource. They have infographics, they have tools, they have what you need to make a sound decision for law school and successfully applying to law school. Discoverlaw.org is the diversity aspect to LSAC, where it lists all these scholarships that, again, I rather you make it a part-time job to apply to scholarships than ignore scholarship opportunities. While they are national scholarships, you never know if you earn one because one of our students, one of our graduates here, earned a $15,000 scholarship from LSA, from the American Bar Association through discoverlaw.org. So I'd rather you try than not try at all. And lastly, americanbar.org, they also have scholarships and they have first gen information and blogs and resources. This is a growing space in law school, so you won't see as many as maybe um, resources for affinity groups, you know, Black law student and um, Latino Law Caucus, like those been in existence for many years. First gen resources are now becoming more plentiful because of the reality of many first gens going to law school. All right, any questions? Questions in the, I have my question tab up, I have my comment tab up. So if you have any questions, I'm going to go on video if you want to see my face. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, Marilena, we do have, yes, we do. Yes, we have fee waivers at UI. So for those who are on the webinar or for those who are watching this recorded, I'm going to be sending this to you to rewatch. You can take the time to answer. And 
if you were to apply back to the email, we are offering fee waivers for those that um, attended the workshop. All you need to do is just reply back to the initial email we'll be sending you. So you're very welcome. All right, so this is me. I'm in my office here in Idaho. If you all are not local, if you are local, come visit me. I hope you found this workshop, um, this webinar helpful. I'm gonna send it to you all. If you have any questions, um, let me put it in the comments. Always email me. Feel free to email me. Free and I will. Oh. Feel free to ask questions, um, all of that. So. I'm going to log off now. If you don't have any other questions, please let me know. If not, good luck with your law school application process. Um, I look forward to getting your application here or receiving your questions. Um, I'm here as a resource and I want you to succeed. You deserve it. Um, you have pushed through many obstacles as first gen for college um, and it's time to continue that and open up your window opportunity once you get into law school, that first semester, when you say you're a first year law student, it already opens up doors. So you deserve the best opportunity possible, and I'm here to help you with that, okay? So if you don't have any further questions, you're very welcome. I'm going to end it, and I'm gonna send it to you all, and have a wonderful afternoon, and good luck with your law school endeavors. Take care.